So hello and welcome to A Taste of China, which is an online program that pairs taste with place to explore China's vast culinary landscape. I'm Dinda Elliott, the Director of Programs at China Institute, and I'm so delighted to be here with my friend, uh, Mei Zhang, the founder of Wild China, who are our partners in this wonderful series. Um, hi, Mei, good to have you. Um, so today we are traveling to Guangdong on China's southern coast, and I'm especially excited about tonight's program because it's about so many important things. Uh, it's about food. It's about farming. It's about technology. It's about the new farm to table movement and the rise of organics in China. And it's about rebuilding the connections between the cities and the countryside and about giving China's farmers a way to hang on to their traditions. So by the way, I just wanted to say to everybody, we will try to um, take questions from the audience at the end. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as we go along. And uh, so May, let me turn it over to you to tell us a little bit more and tell us why we're here before we bring on our first guest. Thank you, thank you, Dinda. Hi, everybody. Um, happy 2021. All right, welcome to A Taste of China's special Wild China on Air series co produced with the China Institute, my dear friend Dinda Elliot. And my name is Zhang Mei. I'm the founder of Wild China, and we specialize in uh, in depth travel to China for both individuals, schools, and companies. And right now, we still, I cannot believe it, a year into this, still cannot travel to China. So we will continue our virtual exploration of China. And this is our 53rd event since February 2020. And we hope there will we will continue the virtual series uh, for many, many more. But we hope you can hit the road soon. Right. So uh, today I'm thrilled to be hosting with Dinda this uh, panel of discussion on organic farming. And we have a panel of fantastic guests. Uh, they are the activists in the organic farming movement in China, really. We will be moving from the top of the supply chain uh, in Shanghai. That's Matilda Ho, who will, uh, who's also a TED speaker, who will give us a little bit of context of where China is in its food movement in relation to the world. And then we will meet uh, Fred, Fred Young, who is currently working to build a bridge between organic farmers and users in Shanghai. He is also in Shanghai. Then Fred will take us with him to um, visit Xiong Guilin in Guangdong, who is a local farmer there, an expert on mushroom farming. And we will see how they sustainably grow mushroom. So that's what we're here for. Back to you, Dinda. Thanks, May. Um, so I'm excited to introduce our first uh, guest, who is Matilda Ho. And Matilda is a serial entrepreneur who's driving to create more sustainable food systems in China. She's the founder of Bits and Bites, China's pioneer tech, food tech venture capital company, investing in startups, tackling global food system challenges. Matilda is also a founder, also the founder of Yimi Shizhi, which you might call the Whole Foods of China. Uh, it's a farm to table grocery e-commerce platform that has engineered food education and transparency into the supply chain and customer experience. Matilda, as, as May just mentioned, Matilda has also been a TED speaker on the future of good food in China. We're very honored to have her join us today. Hi, Matilda, welcome. Hi, hello. Hi, very uh, my truly pleasure to be here. We're thrilled to have you. Um, so Matilda, tell us, how do you, let's just jump right in um, because time is precious. So how do you see technology as a game changer in terms of improving China's uh, food production systems? Yeah, um, if you look at all the agriculture and food investment activities in China, uh, maybe I can share some of the figure out of the 3.6 billion US dollars that went into those type of investment activities in 2019, more than 80% of those 
amount of money went into the downstream. So as we know, uh, we call it the coffee shop chain, the milk tea chain, the meal delivery, the e-commerce grocery, you'll be able to get a piece of garlic within 30 minutes at your doorstep upon your delivery for free. Um, however, in our investment thesis, without the midstream and upstream supply chain technological advancement, it won't be able to support the sustainable um, downstream investment. It's not very, very balanced right now. So how we produce and deliver the food right now is just simply not sustainable. And to be able to provide more resilient, uh, more sufficient supply chain, we do need technology to be able to enable. And that's um, how we wanted to continue to invest in those uh, disrupted technology that will be able to address those food security and food safety challenges that China is facing right now. So let's actually, let's let's drill down on, into that a little bit further. So I, I'm still trying to understand exactly what's the problem that you're solving for. In other words, what's, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned food safety. Is that, is that what, what's the real um, issue that your technology is helping to tackle? Yes, um, there are uh, multiple challenges that we're facing, um, starting from the food security. Um, China represented 20% of the world population, but we only have less than 7% of arable lands. And now the Chinese government is starting to ban zero increasing pesticide and chemical fertilizer input. How can we continue to feed those population without hurting our soil and planet? That is a very big implication. And food safety. Um, right now, every year, China still has uh, nearly half a mil, ha half a million food safety scandal and violations. And how are we going to continue to educate the supplier uh, to bring a safer food processing? That's also another key challenges that we're facing. And then if we talk about human nutrition, now China leads uh, the world's population for both obesity um, and diabetics, and those type of foodborne diseases has no cure. When you become uh, uh, obese, there's no way um, until you change how you eat your food three meals a day, should you be able to really solve that problem. So there are a long list of the systematic challenges that we're facing, but it, it's not, um, uh, we don't have an available ecosystem of VCs or PEs or uh, corporates or startups that uh, can have an ecosystem or network to continue to talk about it or to solve about it. Or, mm -hmm. you know, even the consumer education, everyone thinks that they aspire to be healthy, but they don't know how. They don't know how to eat healthier. They don't know whether they can trust this article that posted online. Um, so a lot of information online, but very, very few knowledge to talk about how you can eat better and healthier. Mm -hmm. And so I think that this is definitely the right time that we really need to bring more like-minded partners mm -hmm. uh, to really think about how to solve that issues. Huh, and is your, so your company, Yimi Shiji, is that actually trying to promote the idea of healthy eating? And um, I know you don't, don't particularly specialize in organic, uh, food, although you have organic food on your platform, but but are you trying to promote that idea of healthier eating? Yeah, I think the the purpose of setting up Emi back in 2015 is very simple. How can we bring and promote transparency from farm to table mm -hmm. and empower our consumers to eat better, healthier, and cleaner mm -hmm. and more mindfully? Mm -hmm. And that mindfulness um, is a really difficult uh, thing to crack. Because like I said, everyone can claim that they're organic. And as you may know, you know, 10 years ago, everyone will be able to uh, find a way and put the organic sticker on the package. And that, that is, we call it Lie Bi Chu Zhu Liang Bi. All the, the good mindful farmers don't know how to bring their organically grown produce to the final consumers. And they have a very high cost to cover their organically grown method. However, um, there are also a lot of those seemingly affordable uh, 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 organic produce that was sold 50% cheaper. So as a consumer, 
you don't know how to find a trusted source. So we started with a very simple mindset. Let's bring an app and let's work with those locally grown farmers. And we help those farmers to send those produce to the SGS or SINA certified facility to test 200 pesticides. And then after a week, we got the report, we put the report on our app. So every consumer can check, mm -hmm. wow, okay, okay, this farmer, they grow this produce without using any chemical fertilizer. How do they achieve that? And then we, we basically write down all their method on our website. So all the consumer have a very mindful education process to know mm -hmm. that, okay, this farmer shown, this farmer, a uh, uh, friend, um, they use this method to be able to bring a very clean produce. And with this consent, then they have their right to make a more mindful choice to buy the produce directly from these farmers. Mm -hmm. And we help those farmers to bring um, their branded produce to the consumer door uh, mm -hmm. with our own coaching logistics. Ah, okay. So, so let's talk for a second about the consumer. I'm really curious about you know, whether Chinese consumers and city dwellers, I guess, in particular, whether they care about this stuff. Um, you know, in America, we've seen the rise of interest in kind of small scale farming and artisanal foods and the idea that you can somehow know where your food comes from. You know, you might even know mm -hmm. the specific farm that your food came from. Are you seeing that in China as well? Are people, do people, do people in the cities increasingly want that kind of information or what do you what do you see in the consumer yeah that it's definitely a, a very interesting trajectory when we t uh, think about consumers purpose for food you know after the world war ii i think every family in china is only thinking about one thing how can i eat full how can i chew the ball right uh i don't i don't care if it's empty calorie or it's organic or whatnot it, as long as i have a big bowl of rice that's great yeah. And then the second trajectory after a decade, then everyone thinking about, okay, I need to eat well. How can I transform from chi de bao to chi de hao? I need to eat better. And that typically means that, okay, can I not just eat vegetables? Can I have more pork? Can I have more meat? Can mm -hmm. I have a red meat? Um, so, you know, not only the Chinese New Year, I can, I can slaughter a pig for my whole villages. I want to eat more. Um, and, and now uh, since, 10 years ago, especially if you see Shanghai, Beijing, or Guangzhou, people now thinking about, I need to not only eat well, I need to eat healthy. Everyone was starting to go to the gym. I wanted to, you know, uh, download the app. I wanted to, you know, jump on my house, at my house for 10 minutes. I need to start becoming a healthy person. And they started to realize, okay, maybe I shouldn't eat that much why rice? I need to start eating some grain, five grain rice. I need to start eating brown rice. Maybe I need to eat more protein. How can I get more cleaner protein? So now everyone has the aspiration to be healthy, but how can I educate more people to uh, define what a healthy diet should be? Mm -hmm. That is something that I think people are starting to have that disposable income and have more time to access those website video or information to educate themselves, especially um, when those mother starting to prepare um, that they wanted to have a baby. They mm -hmm. starting to be more mindful about, okay, I need to start to be healthier so that my baby can be born healthier. And when they started to have a baby, and six months in, they started to think about, okay, I need to prepare those fu shi, I need to prepare those baby food. Now I need to find a trustable source and channel to buy organic pumpkin to provide, you know, organic vegetables so that my baby can have all this clean food. So we do starting to see there is a trajectory of more and more middle-class family that has those aspiration. Yeah. And what we're trying to do is help them to really change their behavior and have more accessible and affordable source for those clean food. Yeah, it's so I, I'm so glad you mentioned middle class because that was exactly what I was just going to say is it feels like it seems like this is the perfect manifestation of the rise of the middle class in China. And I think that we in the United States really have a hard time kind of understanding that there really is a real middle class that's that's you know growing in china and that's really not that very not that different 
from the middle class in America in many ways in terms of aspirations and lifestyles and all that stuff. It's, it's yeah. I think, you know, hard for us to remember that. So one final question for you, Matilda, before we go over to um, Fred to, to uh, you know, talk more specifically about farming. What are the biggest challenges for your business? Um, is it that trust factor or what, you know, what are the, what are the challenges? Yeah, I'm really glad that you mentioned trust because trust is indeed um, a huge issue given all the, you know, food safety scandals and uh, people, you know, generally don't believe the organic. They don't think that organic food is necessarily better for you. Um, and they don't know how you can trust um, everyone can claim that they have organic products on, on their platform. And how do you know China is so big and so fragmented? How do you know that now you have a, 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 a certification on your app, but maybe you know tomorrow morning there is a raining day and uh, the farmer might borrow the fruits from their neighbor so that they can still have the money to fulfill that day. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a huge trust issue there. And that's why we often like to say that it is the process. It's not necessarily the result that you can, br you can build that brand trust with your customers. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is every single component, we're trying to be as an enablement of that trust. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, we will go to, we will go to the village, we will bring our photographer, we will make a five minutes video about how farmers really grow their food without any chemical input. Uh, we will write their stories. Um, we will also, um, even on the package, sometimes we will draw the farmer's face on the package wow. as a way to let people know that, see, this is the farmer. And we even publish all the farm address the farm owner's name. We sometimes name the vegetables behind the real farmer's name. And mm -hmm. we encourage people to drive the car uh, in the weekend to go see the farmers, to talk to them. That is the essential why we call ourselves a farmer's market, that you really meet the farmers face to face. And that, that really brings that level of trust to another level. And, and of course, we also like to say a mindful patience because, you know, if you wanted to grow good food, that takes time. Um, you know, if you wanted to raise a chicken without adding antibiotics, it's not 45 days, it's 180 days. So we, we also know that building trust takes time. And that's why most of our loyal customers are through word of mouth. It's not through the coupon, it's not through the promotion. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is probably our biggest challenge. How do you build that mindful business mm -hmm. in a country that is almost a crime to take it slow? Um, All <laughs> right. Wow. That is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. And, and the idea that you're kind of connecting herb city people once again to the countryside is kind of like bringing humanity back into our, you know, crazy modern lives. And um, that's just a wonderful thing that you're doing. So, so thank you, Matilda, so much. That is just fascinating. And don't go, don't go far away. Okay, stick around for a little bit. We're going to bring you back later. Um, but we're now going to turn to, we're going to turn back to May, who's going to introduce our next guest. But May, I think if you don't mind, we're going to first show 40 seconds of a little video clip of Perfect. Fred, Fred Young's project. So I think Aaron's going to run 40 seconds and then you can introduce Fred. Perfect. Hopefully this will work. We're struggling against the problems in Shanghai. And in 2008, we decided to move out of the giant city and return to our home village. And I came to realize I was destined to be a farmer, a farmer that would create change through a new model. As much I saw positive of village life, I started to notice its challenges as well. Since 2008, almost 80% population of my village just moved to the cities for better life. Only 100 out of 900 people have remained. And now, most of people staying in the village are either over 70 years or just below 10 years old. So it's an amazing little introduction. Um, so over to you, May. Perfect way to launch into the conversation with Fred. Um, it, it's very interesting. I just want to connect to, to what Matilda said. I think 
they produced this fantastic series of short films of the farmers and one of which I watched was in, in the Mongolia. It was the endearing. When you see how the farmers live, you really feel connected to food. And I think that's the connection a lot of us uh, city dwellers are missing. Um, I would love to go on one of these trips with Matilda to see that. Now, Fred, you um, took a leap of faith, right? Um, and jumped straight into the, the, the farming, actual farming work yourself as well. In any event, let me back up and introduce Fred Young, who founded, as you just saw in the video clip, a rainbow of hope and organization that works to strengthen the rural communities ties uh, through sustainable agriculture uh, with urban communities. Uh, and. Um, Fred is the first person from his home village in rural Hunan to attend university. And after that, took a very normal path at all, as all Chinese young people do, went to Shanghai and started teaching English there and pursued a corporate career, and then decided to return. So Fred, I'm going to come to you now. But first of all, thank you for taking the time. And tell us, tell us, uh, expand beyond the video, why you decided to work eco-farming? Well, I think that uh, now I think it's, uh, it's just a dream of the, from my childhood has really brought me back to, uh, uh, to my home. First of all, I think the dream is I would like to contribute some, something to the change of the life in my home villages, like the villages are like, a, like my village, home village. And secondly, I would like really some change in my life in my food because I was not used to the food I had in Shanghai. So I think that's why I just returned to my home. It, it, is, it, is it common? Like now everybody's moving from country to city. You move in the reverse direction. Uh, is, is this a new trend? Are you seeing many of your friends doing similar things? Well, I, I, I have seen some, some friends, but quite some of them because uh, I'm one of them because I, I think I'm, I'm one of the earliest who just returned from the uh, from the city to to the to the to the countryside. So mm -hmm. I know quite a few of them now in China. And what do they do? Well, they just returned and they want to to do some farming and they enjoy the pristine life there. I uh -huh. think that's why. Uh -huh. See, it, it's interesting. We had a conversation with um, a, an author who lives in Dali, who is witnessing the migration of city dwellers to mm -hmm. idyllic countryside in Dali. And um, after a while, the challenges of living in the country becomes too big. And quite a few of them choose to reverse, to, to return to the city. Um, do you think that could happen to you and your friends? Uh, it, it could, it could, but because, um, mm, you know, it was still difficult for you to, to really to live on, on farming just there, unless you, um, you are really very good at marketing and, and then you can market yourself very well. And then you can, you, you can get, uh, get connected to the market and then you can, maybe you can, uh, sustain your life in, in the countryside. And, and that's happening now because, uh, because there's more opportunities for, for, for such people to market themselves. They have the resources from, from on, online platforms like uh, you know, WeChat you know, uh, and other social media. Douyin? Yes. Take, take yeah. yeah. And red, yeah. So uh, now let's uh, dive in to understand a little bit. Of how does Rainbow of Hope work? Simply, we just connected. A, Rainbow of Hope just connects individual farmer households directly with the 10 to 20 cents, uh, 20 cent families. The city families subscribe all the food that these um, farmer household grow and eat. So the it's just like sharing of uh, the uh, surplus of uh, the farmer, farmer household with the city family. And in return, they get some cash income. Mm -hmm. the, and a very similar question to what we were trying to discuss with Matilda earlier that who, who defines uh, your food as organic food? 
And how do you how do you enforce to make sure the farmers are practicing organic farming? That's a very good question. I think it's a, it's quite a challenge for most of the uh, distribu for the distributors. What Raymond of Hope does is Raymond of Hope will we will, we have the standards so chemical free, and we turn to like we need them to do like permaculture or biodynamic or Chinese conventional uh, farming practice. Uh, but chemical free for, for sure. And then on the other hand, we need the farmer cooperative instead of just an individual farmer household because they are not well disciplined, they are not well planned, they are not well organized. So we need the farmer cooperative to coordinate all the um, production and as well as with the market side. So the farmer cooperative will make sure that the uh, chemicals are not used. And Thirdly, we'll do some random test testing. You know, when the uh, like like the vegetable goes to your doorstep, we'll ha ask the uh, courier man to take a sample, just one sample from from the box, and that sample will directly be delivered by the same courier man to the uh, testing lab for testing. So we have this. Of course, one more the. Uh, Matching city family, they can go there, drive to the uh, to visit the farmer, and I think that's a kind of like a super inspection or supervision. Mm. Well, that's um, yeah. So, is it easy to find farmers who are willing to to, to uh, be no, part of this? No, I would not not say it's easy, because uh, the farmers they, they they really love freedom. They love to live their free life, so they don't want to. Oh, this is too trouble. I want. I need to pack everything each week, and I want. I need to talk to people. I need to, you know, do this, do that. That's not the, their life. You know, they want. They want simple, uh, life to be very simple, as what it is. So then you need to find some, really some coordinators. That's why we need a farmer cooperative because they will do. They will find the right people, and they know the honest man in the village, in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, there. So, yeah. That's so, it. So, so which side is harder? Is it harder to find good farmers who would do organic farming? Or is it harder to find buyers in the city who would pay the, I assume it's a premium price, is a premium price for your produce? Which side is harder? Well, I think it's, uh, to me, I think it's, because I'm not a marketing man. So it's, it's more challenging for me to find the buyers on, on, in this, on, the, on the urban side. Uh, then, well, it's not premium. It's not premium price, uh, price for me because uh, what we try to do is to try to actually cut off the the cost. No, not cost because it's, there's a direct connection between between the two sides. So the price can be, I think, at least a third, uh, thirty percent, at least thirty percent, maybe even even forty to fifty percent lower than than those. Uh, claimed uh, organic uh, organic uh, produces on the on the market. Really? Yes. I'm the, honest with you. Where 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 did the savings come from? Because I understand it takes more effort to grow food organically. Um, it, is well, the savings from distribution? No, let me t tell you the story because now I actually I had a really uh, made a diagram. There's lots of uh, waste on the supply chain. Uh, according to my rough research, the, the, uh, currently only 25% the harvest from the field is consumed by the end consumer into the stomach, you know, into the stomach. Because lots of it have been either lost on the, on the farm or been rejected by the supermarket because they need perfect looking stuff. And then the, on the shelf, you know, at least 20% is you know, wasted on the shelf. The, those are just wasted. So, you know, those waste can be of value to the, to the farmer. And then they can, the waste will be always uh, borne by the and consumers, if they buy the perfect looking and mm -hmm. in, from the supermarket, I'm not trying to mark, I mean, supermarkets are good, but, uh, but you know, they, they, uh, that's, that's just my rough research. 
uh, even just the savings of from waste yes. um, by not and, wasting, you save that yeah. much. And the okay. profit. Mm -hmm. And profit for the for the for the middleman because they they will look into more at the profit instead of any other value. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Um, and um, okay, so now moving on, I think we're going to be visiting um, Xiong Guiling, a mushroom farmer in Guangdong. But before we go to him, could you tell us a little bit why is mushroom farming a great tool in sustainable farming? And tell us a little bit about your relationship and uh, Xiong Guiling. How does he, wh what role does he play in your rainbow of hope? Well, uh, Xiong, Mr. Xiong has been, uh, we are, have been friends for over 10 years. Uh, so we, I started uh, organic farming from a uh, mushroom, a stack mushroom. And so that's why we got to know each other. And he actually started started mush, mushroom grow, grow farming uh, Oh, around 10 years ago from when he graduated from the university and then we became friends. To me, I think mushroom plays a very important role in the ecosystem. It's a kind of a fungi. The fungi play an important role in, eco, uh, in, nat in, in nature because it, uh, you know, all the mushroom in, uh, decompose wood and grass in nature into organ organic stuff and get those stuff back into soil. Mm -hmm. So when we grow mushroom, we actually speed up the, speed up the, uh, the process of a de uh, decomposing of uh, the organic stuff like uh, wood and the grass uh, into, uh, into, into the organic fertilizer. So I think it's very important, very good. And then, then uh, really mushroom, uh, mushrooms are very nutritious and uh, delicious as well. So that's why I love it. Fantastic, fantastic, thank you. Now let's head to Guangdong where uh, farmer Xiong Guiling will show us around his mushroom farm and explain the process of sustainable farming. Uh, please stay on Fred, we will need your expertise and language to, to interpret for us okay, I will. what we're seeing. Okay. Guiling, okay. uh, uh, ping. Yeah, yeah. Hey, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, so maybe Guilin can tell us a little bit about himself. Uh, Guilin, please introduce 我在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东省长期在广东
好的，好的。呃、uh, ，so first the raw materials uh could be either uh wood or grass. So like the uh the stems of uh the rice the rice straws and and the stems of other crops like uh, corn. So the those these materials can all be built into the log of uh mushrooms. 等我两分钟行不行？我把那木杆拿上来吧。呃，您您尽快一点好吧，因为他这个时间有点紧。没关系，你就给我们看、哦、看一下，嗯、比如说你的那个锅炉，你在家。对，锅炉你这怎么怎么做的就行了。是呃，就是上次说说的木杆，用的木枪那些打好包。然后就看。They have to pack the materials. The wood can. Should be uh, uh, be made into into uh, like saw. They can use the saw uh the saw dust or the slices of uh the wood, or the wood just a uh short wood log. 那就是这些材料，呃，这些有木糠，有玉米粉。我们一般用的这些，像这些玉米粉。Uh, the corn, the corn powder. 就玉米啊，用玉米跟木屑。And then you store dust. With the store dust, this is the corn, uh, corn powder. 就玉米跟这个木屑这些材料混在一起。Wood slices and they they mix mix the mix the all the materials. 然后装到这包里。Into the put them into one bag. 嗯，用用用机器把它装进去，这个是装袋的，用机器装进去，料、yeah, 进来，然后就装进去。Yeah, this is the 装进去之后就高温消毒。Uh, use to pack the materials, and then they need to sterilize the the bag with the steam. So they use heat. They steam the the bag of water. Yes, this yes, and and then they got yeah they got this they got this uh this bag. And then they need to plant the seed into the into the bag. 开始装进去就这样，然后把这个菌种放从这里放进去。Now, so they put the plant the seed into it, and then you can be seen, can see, uh, seen real in the, uh, in the bag and the the uh the white one. Uh huh. The seed of mushroom. Yeah, yeah, of, of mushroom, and then it grow. 嗯、然后这个白色的这个就是蘑菇的菌种菌丝，等这个它就是说逐步全部长好，这菌丝就像那个树根一样的，就占领整个木木料。Which is like、uh, the roots of uh, the roots of the、uh, the trees, and then then when it builds all this back. So it starts from this brown color with seeds, and then they grow and expand the white color to, to the to cover the entire log, basically. Right. Yes. Right. And then yeah. yeah. And then, then it starts that, to. That does... Oh, that there it is. And then they you will get the、uh, start to get some mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's the process. It's. You get, it, you it's too bad the U.S. Customs won't allow those things through the customs. Otherwise, I would like to have some. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, you can. And,、uh, you can、so、grow them. Out of because we are running a little short on time,、mm -hmm. I see Dinda's beautiful face there. Can we just quickly talk about once the mushroom is grown, what happens to all the waste? Oh, uh, 那个桂林，现在我们时间有点短，有有有点紧啊。你跟告诉一下大家，这个。长了蘑菇以后，这这些废物你怎么来利用？嗯、就是剩下的这些东西你怎么来利用？你要告诉一下大家。呃，就是说这些蘑菇采完之后，这个蘑菇包就把它，呃，像这些包，它就可以这样，呃，就可以倒出来，就是在树下面作为肥料，这些就种菜。So after this, after the mushroom, in all the wood and or the corn, corn powder will compose. Decomposed into soil, into organic fertilizer, and actually he、um, he cannot show show us the banana his banana 
uh, banana trees, but he has banana trees and he can put all the logs in the earth, in the soil, under the, under the uh, banana trees. So the banana trees provide a very good shading for the, uh, for the mushroom. And then in return, the mushrooms gives back the organic fertilizer for the, for the banana trees. Great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. So I if, if, I could, if I could, um, I actually, I came on not to tell you about time, but just because I have a question I wanted to ask. So okay. I'm, really, I'm so curious. Um, so Fred, maybe you can translate for Xiong Guilin. So he's a uni university graduate and you're a university graduate. Um, so he is, I guess I would call it a professional farmer. You know, yes. he's it's and and that I think is something very very new in China. In the mm -hmm. old days, you would never have a university graduate go back to the farm and learn to do professional farming like this. So, I'd love to just ask you both to talk about that a little bit. Is that a new? Is that a new trend? Um, why did Xiong Guilin decide to, you know? work on a farm instead of going to work for some big agricultural company. Okay, Guining, well, Guining, yes, 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 Dina and you should winning, you get that you want to teach a woman, those are that you're strong. Nama, that she be a lay ho, in guy, which man may or two gay, not on that you know, no, yeah, go see, go to earning, can't you, can't get a two key lie, so they're no, yeah. So, Jen, what did you be so she want to you? First, first of all, he enjoys the freedom, the free life, free life. And I think that's a characteristics of a Chinese farmers from both myself. Uh, 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 he prefers natural stuff. If he goes to the to the mushroom, you know, really a very big mushroom farm, then that will be industrialized because everything will be done just indoor and like just like a factory. So he doesn't like the industrial. He enjoys natural stuff instead of the industrialized stuff. Fantastic question. Yeah, and are the are the the techniques and the science that he learned in university. Are they useful to him now? And do they have has his does he have a a better life, you know, because of this new these technologies that he can use? Um, you know, if he didn't go to university, would he be as successful? Uh Guining, how do you 知识跟技能对你有对你的目前有有很大的帮助吗 Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Sean just gives up affirmative uh, um, answer to you. That's yes. Uh, he's, uh, he's knowledge, uh, he, what he learned from the university has helped him a lot. And according to his point, a, you know, farmers in, 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 in China, they need the indigenous, indigenous indigenous farmers they do need some techniques and knowledge to help them improve the uh, uh, production i i just want to cut in here and just share something we've been working in the rural area called songyang which is four hours ride from shanghai mm -hmm. and one of the biggest challenges is talented university graduate youth are not willing to return or they return, then they only want to work for the government and become Yuan, right? Or they want to find a job in Hangzhou. So my hats off to both of you. I, th I think you are doing incredible service to, to the countryside of, of China. Um, what do you think, Dinda? Shall we, um, I, th I see quite a few questions here. Yeah. 
um, let's let's invite Matilda back and yep. we, while she's rejoining us, uh, we have one question here directly for Mr. Xiong and we can get to that. Approximately Perfect. how much of your mushroom do you sell locally on how much gets shipped to other cities? This is from Alan Berry. Uh, 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 在你的当地的市场卖的是多少价格 然后卖到外卖到外地的话会是多少价格这个这个品种不一样啊我们做的就好多品种啊he has different varieties so it all depends on the variety 那它的那个比例多少是当地的多少是运走的 what's the rate 这个对 一半一半吧 50 local, 50 shipped uh, outside. Mm -hmm. wow. That's great. And I'm curious about the size of his business, the scale of his business. How much land does he have? And what's the kind of, you know, gross annual sales or whatever? What sort of size of business is he running? Okay, 这里啊，这里是原来一个方位的学校，呃，当时说的面积大概十五亩吧，一公顷这样子。呃，one uh, acre, uh, yeah, fifteen mu, fifteen mu, I don't know what's that, fifteen mu, and he is based in the abandoned primary school in 呃，很多都做，我们做灵芝、香菇、木耳、莲子、stucky mushroom, and，这些，番薯，and，oyster mushroom, lot, a lot. Yeah. And, and before yeah. we go back to uh, bringing Matilda back into the conversation, um, can uh, Mr. Xiong tell us a little bit more about his life? Does he have, um, you know? Comforts that a city dweller might like. Does he have a nice big television? Does he have a car? You know, what what is his life like in the countryside? <laughs> okay, Wei Ning, you introduce yourself. You, your own family life. He asks, "Ah, ah, come to Wei Ning. You are Wei Ning. Is your is there a car? Is there a big TV? Is there any other things in the city? Ah, ah, family life. Ah, ah, family life. Ah, ah, family life. Ah, ah, family life. 呃，我有车，有两个小孩，然后我我小孩的是在县城读书上学。His kids went now go to school in the county level, a county county town, a city, and then they return to 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 the village in on the weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you think that your children will be farmers also? 你的小孩会会成为以后也会从从事农业吗？ It all depends on, the, you know, he cannot decide. <laughs> uh huh. Great. So, um, Matilda, there are a number of questions here for you um, as well. So, I wonder, okay, so one person is asking, um, what kind of farmers does Imi, Imi Shizhi work with? And, and I guess the more important thing is how do you select the farmer partners and the producers that you're working with? Um, is it commercial farms or individual farmers like Mr. Xiong? Um, you know, how does that work? Yeah, um, well, it's a complicated uh, 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 question. In terms of our sourcing principles, uh, first of all, we trying to promote local food because um, local food has two benefits. One, you know your customers, you know your farmers better, is closer, and it also reduces the carbon footprint uh, during the shipping of the food. So for example, uh, take fruits as an example. Um, most of the strawberry, it's the strawberry season right now. Uh, we only work with the strawberry farmers that grow their strawberries in Shanghai, uh, uh, blueberries as well. But apples uh, in Shanghai, we can't really grow apples um, in, the, in the warmer weather. So we will have to work with the Xinjiang farmer, Shandong farmer, Shanxi farmer for um, those apples. We, we have an old saying, 一方水土养一方人. So we really wanted to make sure that 
um, the land uh, can grow the seasonal fruits um, that can automatically bring the best taste uh, for the market. So we, we have the local um, uh, principle as the key. And then second of all, uh, then we wanted to uh, visit the farm. We actually have a, a dairy, we have a checklist that our sourcing manager will go to the farm to make sure that you know their management governance is there. Um, there's no um, you know, uh, technical difficulties for them. Um, th th there is a checklist that we wanted to um, take care of it. You know, we like to say that it's a combination of art and science because we do know even if we just send a sample to the testing facility uh, for insurance, we, we don't know every single day in the future whether they can con continue to have the consistently good quality of those produce. So I think, you know, knowing your farmer, knowing their farming method is also a very key uh, sourcing uh, principle for us. Mm -hmm. I see the second half of this question, which is very interesting, is does Imi Shiji share the costs and profits with the farmers or is Imi Shiji a, a for-profit venture or a non-profit venture? Yeah, we are a for-profit uh, for organization. We do believe that um, the uh, sustainable business uh, should be taking equal importance on the purpose and profit. So what we do is we wanted to grow the business fast um, on the consumer side and so that we will be able to influence more and more farmers that convert from conventional farming method to the organically grow method. And we don't, we don't like to say organic just because, you know, in China, there is a, a very, very difficult situation. You have to pay at least 200,000 renminbi a year that will be able to get that organic license. And it's going to be very difficult for a small farmer to have that um, uh, 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 money to be able to get that. So we like to uh, say that pesticide-free, chemical-free, local food, there are many, many ways um, to define what a mindful food choice could be. Mm -hmm. um, so so we, we, don't, we don't like to say organic is just one of the ways. We do work with some of the medium-sized farmers that they've been working um, on the farm business uh, more than 10 years. And then they starting to you know, scale um, to, to a bigger farm. And we think that's a very beautiful, successful story to inspire more small farmers to scale up their business. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna jump in with another question for um, Fred and Xiong Guilin, um, which is, you know, I, I'm curious, I guess, Fred, you're, to work with the farmers that you work with, I guess you have higher standards than, uh, you know, because it's organic or, or and certified and all these things, it's higher standards than just your average farmer. And so my question for you and Xiong Guilin is, are there other farmers around him? You know, Tajowei的农户, are some of the other farmers, they say, oh, forget it, it's too much trouble. I don't wanna bother with this, all of these fancy standards and requirements. Is it, is it you know, does Xiong Guilin find that there are some of the other farmers in his community, they do not wanna participate in this kind of project? Guilin, uh,就是在我们周围的这些在你周围的这些村民他们其实大部分其实我接触的到只是说你做出来
，即便说你自己种的东西，如果是说有农药放置范围那些自己不吃，但是你还是要买别人给你的东西啊。OK， 呃、uh, ，not not really. He he gave the negative answer to to your question. To your question, he says that everybody, including the farmers as well as the city city dwellers,、uh, they want good and healthy food. Uh, but But on the on the city side, you know, the city fam,、uh, city uh, consumers, they think they they need to pay more, and、uh, they are not affordable on the market. And on the other other side, in the farmers, they want to do in a natural way. But the question is, if they do that way, they cannot sell all the pro、uh, or their their produces, and then there there could be the failure for for them. So that's、uh, the conflict. So it's、uh, a, a higher risk for the farmers,、mm -hmm. yeah. right? Uh huh. Which I think is a perfect segue into a question here from Inma. It says that this person is in Guangdong Province. By the way, you can subscribe to Rainbow of Hope and get Xiong Guilin's mushroom. And、uh, <laughs> the question is, the, they're very curious about whether live streaming and e-commerce. Uh, have changed the the dilemma that Xiong Guilin was describing. Has it?、Uh, do you have any remarkable examples that e-commerce has broken the barrier and reached consumers? Ah,、uh, Guilin, 就是像目前呃刚才讲的这种这种困境啊，就是呃城市跟乡村之间的这种困境，没没法一个是没法买，一个是没法卖。对，目前的这种，比如说像。嗯，像我们的那抖音啊，这些，还有一些电子商务，是不是对这个有一个很大的促进？对这个问题有很有一个解决的方案了？你感觉到？就像直播，我觉得有好也有坏。就说抖音有些东西又又传出的好的，有时候也传出坏的东西出来。你说如果能够真实反映的，可能会有促进作用，但是反而有些抖音会。呃，有些投机的在上面的展示，反而让人家对这些真实性的怀疑态度更更加强烈。所以说那些东西也说不清楚。反正现在个人感觉，做有机、做生态这些东西，还是在自己建立自己的信任那个信任体系的。靠外力好像现在都挺难的。嗯、oh. so, ，So Mr. Shang， 嗯、um, ，His answer is， 呃、uh...。Tick and talk, and you know, this social media can help, but you know those stuff can also be used by some, be made advantage by some by some、uh, speculists or opportunists, opportunists, and then it actually worsen the situations for the uh, the uh, for the、uh, for the trust. And、mm -hmm. he believes that personal tr、uh, no, tr personal trust could help more, so he thinks could still you know, relies on personal trust. We do one more question, and then I'm afraid it's really time's up, unfortunately. 还有最后一个，嗯，一个问题问一下。So I guess this is. Go ahead.、Uh, did you want to ask one, May? Oh、uh, no, you go ahead. I was thinking we were out of time. Okay. Yeah, I mean, this is it's a bit similar, but it's it's a very interesting way of asking the question. Ron Bird is asking. Okay, so Fred, this is this is might be difficult to translate, but. Is do the do, do the local non-organic farmers? So the other farmers around him who are not、mm -hmm. doing this organic farming, do they think he is an innovator? In other words, someone who's you know brilliant、mm -hmm. and coming up with、mm -hmm. new ideas, or do they think he's a disruptor? So he's making life more difficult for them. Ah, Guilin, you have a question to ask. Ah, is say. 你在这里做这个有机生态农业，嗯、那么周围的周围的这些村民是认为你是一个破坏者呢，还是一个啊、呃？对于那些周围不做有机农业的这些村民，你他们会认为你是一个破坏者呢，还是一个创新者、创新人士？呃，不至于说你是破坏者，只是说他不做有机人、有机的人，他只是说觉得自己做不了而已。那你难做，他可能就说会持一些怀疑态度看着你啊。但是你说他至于对你有什么敌意，这个倒不至于，因为，呃，现在都感觉这个市场也好，环境都好，都是挺挺公平平等的，也没有说一下子
呃，你做的跟人家不一样，就对你有敌意的。我觉得倒倒不会，只是说人家做那种的，就可能大部分人持有的态度就是觉得你可能生存不下去，或者做不了，因为现在就说大环境或者说整体的觉得你的。生存空间会相对小，还是说中国的传这种时间做的长的这种模式比较新新奇吧？其实很多人都想做，包括你说那些工厂的也好，在这些做呃传统的这种模式也好，他们其实也想做成好的，只是无非就是最后也是自己呃做出来也卖不掉，或者说销售跟出跟不上。其实我觉得大部分还是想想往好的做，就算是他们。呃，有时候为了钱在做主，其实还是希望的对身体好的东西，只是说是环境逼着他们没办法了。我觉得是这样的，反正我接触的人，我个个人感觉都不至于说有敌意，只是说看你觉得不一定做得下去哦，就觉得这个意思吧。好、oh, ，Mr. Just make it really short. Uh, Mr. Shun says he he hasn't felt any hospitality. Uh, no, no, no. Host hostility from uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, hostility from the land organic farmers, and he thinks all the farmers are good, uh, have nice heart. They want to do good things, but they challenge that. If they do that, can they survive? You know. So this is a question for him as well, because uh, this is a question uh, from the non-organic farmers for for Mr. Shun also. Yeah, it's brilliant, 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 Fred. You are an amazing, amazing interpreter. So I want to thank you for that. And um, you know, unfortunately, we're out of time now, and we could talk and talk and talk for so much longer. There's so much to learn. But um, we're so happy that you all joined us, and so grateful. Um, and I hope to our audience, I hope that you will all join us for the next episode in this series, which is going to be on Tuesday, March 9th. Uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and it, we, it will take us to the west, to the spice capital of China, Chengdu, Sichuan. And we'll be releasing more information about that next program soon. So please sign up for our newsletters or check back on our websites to register. Um, I also want to invite you to tune into the next few China Institute Pieces of China ep episodes. Um, we will have Yale's top uh, China curator. We're going to have a Chinese wallpaper expert, and we're going to have a wonder, the wonderful author and journalist Jim Fallows on the harrowing flight he co-piloted from Changsha to Zhuhai. Um, so, we'll, and we'll also have lots of fun programs around Chinese New Year. So, please do join us. But before I hand it over to May, I just again want to thank you all, Matilda. Thank you so much. Fred, thank you so much. Chong Guilin, you are all so inspiring. So, Het, Fred, I hope that you will translate that for Chong Guilin. It's really so inspiring to hear about your work. And thank you for sharing it with our audience tonight. Um, so, and I also, of course, want to thank May and the Wild China team for their incredible work on this program. So, over to you, May. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I can only second what Dinda just said. Um, I think Matilda and Guilin and Fred, all of you are in for an uphill fight. It's not gonna be easy for, to build trust in the organic farming movement, but I am just delighted that you guys are there um, leading the way. So wish you lots of good luck and thank you so much for opening our eyes to a different side of um, Chinese food. And um, yes, like Dinda said, we, we are going to explore more virtually as well as next year, the, later this year, join Wild China to see them. And Dinda, I love your programs and you did not ask for donations <laughs> or join your membership, but I think China Institute is fantastic. I want <laughs> all of us to be a member and join. Um, next, Wild China also has a Wild China uh, book talk series, and we are reading Xin Ran's book on the, it's called The Good Women of China. It's one of the most sort of sad, heartbreaking, harrowing story that I've read on Chinese women. It truly touched me and I hope you can join us and you can find all this information on wildchina.com. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Dinda. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. 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 Thank you.